Hey, everybody. Hey. Good. Well, good. Beat me to it. I'm doing pretty good, I think. I think. Yeah, I think. Um, how are you doing? Good. Yeah. Allergies not keeping you down too badly? Okay. Getting close. Getting close to spring break. I, I can almost taste it. Anybody got plans for spring break? Going on vacations? Yeah, some folks, some folks not. I'm going to Houston. Yeah, that's where my my family lives, and my sister just had a baby. I haven't met I haven't met the baby yet, so I'm kind of excited about it. I mean, you guys are cool and all, but like the whole time I'm here, I'm just like in a couple of weeks, I'm going to Houston to meet the baby. Today we're going to be talking about. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry, I got a little something in my chest that's making everybody talk. <coughs> Nope, didn't work. <coughs> ah, there we go. I got it out. All right. Um, so today we're going to be talking about explanations. I'm actually going to make a post relatively uh, soon here um, about the way that some of us were answering that, that one quiz question from the homework quiz a little while back that was a free response where I asked you to make a generalization. A lot of people didn't actually make a generalization. Uh, you offered reasons for something, but the reasons that you were offering were more like explain. Like you, you start, you went to like some conclusion that was like most A's are B's, and then in order to justify it, you didn't say because look at all these cases that establish a pattern. You offered an explanation for why somebody like for why it was likely to assume that most A's would be B's. Something that would kind of uh, we'll, we'll get a sense of it uh, a sense of it today. Another, one of the reasons why we're looking at explanations today, aside from the fact that like, whoa, a lot of people were using explanations instead of generalizations on that assignment, is because we just got finished talking about causal arguments. And at our last meeting when we were talking about this, I mentioned that you can look at these as inductive arguments, but it's possible to look at them as like a sort of likely inference that doesn't really quite fit the pattern that most inductive arguments do fit. And this would suggest another kind of likely inference called abductive inferences. So causal inferences. What's going on there? Well, I'm establishing not just that there is some sort of pattern of association between A and B, but that they're causally linked. And when we were talking about this, we looked at Mill's methods and established that these are ways of establishing that that causal link really is there. But one of the drawbacks of Mill's methods as we discussed, or as I discussed at least, was that it doesn't always tell us what direction the causation goes. And one of the ways that I can start to get at the direction of causation is to think of a causation not so much uh, as a pattern that says whenever A happens, B also happens, but to think of a causal argument, to think of saying that like A causes B as offering an explanation for what the link between A and B is. Like why is it that whenever A happens, B happens? And this does something just a little bit different. I don't know how closely you read, for example, uh, I think like some of the first chapters in our book, but one of the things that Vaughn mentions, I think it's in chapter one of The Power of Critical Thinking, very, very early on is to say that explanations aren't arguments. Mm, that's not quite true. We're going to see today how explanations can be arguments. So abductive arguments, if there is a different kind of class of likely inferences besides inductive ones, we might refer to them as abductive inferences. And what an abductive inference is, is something where its strength, I'm going to come to some sort of conclusion and I'm going to say, all right, here's my conclusion and I'm going to wonder like, well, why? Why is that conclusion a good one to draw from my premises? And my answer is going to be because if my conclusion was true, it would explain all of my premises. The strength of an abductive inference comes from the idea that my conclusion would be a good explanation for my premises. This is a weird sort of inference, and we're going to look at uh, today how evaluating these sorts of inferences is also a little bit weird. Sometimes instead of referring to these as abductive inferences, we'll refer to these as inferences to the best explanation. I'll, I think maybe later on I might abbreviate that with ITBE. Inference to the best explanation. And you might notice that, uh, well, before I get into that, let's uh, take a closer look at what's going on here. We've got some kind of phenomenon P, or some kind of cluster 
of phenomena P. We say, like, there's a whole bunch of things that have happened, and we've noticed that they've happened, and everybody can agree that they've happened. But there's something, there's something peculiar about them. There's something in noticing this phenomenon or set of phenomena that says, that kind of like provokes us to wonder why. There's something noteworthy. There's something that demands some sort of explanatory satisfaction. Just like a curiosity, like a little bit of a mental itch going on when I notice the phenomena. I offer up a hypothesis, H, which would be an explanation, which would say that, like, well, it wouldn't be that weird if we assumed that this explanation were true. And then I try to demonstrate somehow that the hypothesis is the best of those that are available. And if that's the case, then I've got good reason to suppose that that hypothesis is, in fact, true, that it's not just something that I'm kind of suggesting that it's something that I might actually be able to believe. And notice one of the things that's going on here is that we're referring to this as an inference to the best explanation. I did this out of order, apparently. Let's do it out of order anyway. We're talking about this as an inference to the best explanation. This means that we need to entertain more than one explanation, right? If I'm going to say that we're making an inference to the best available explanation, I need to have more than one that I'm comparing. So let's go back to that example that I just skipped over. Um, although both the front and rear doors were found open after the burglary, there were pry marks around the lock on the rear door and deposits of mud near the threshold. It must be the case then that the thief entered through the rear door and left through the front. Can you see how if you came home and found the rear door open and the front door open and there was mud that was tracked in and pry marks around the lock on the rear door and things were missing from your house, this would be the sort of thing that you'd be like, huh, that's weird. This demands an explanation, right? And the explanation on offer says it must be the case that the thief entered through the rear door and left through the front door. Is that a reasonable explanation? Based on the evidence, it seems reasonable. If the, thieves, if the thieves did, in fact, come through the rear door and leave through the front door, that would explain why it was that both doors were open. It would explain why there were pry marks around the lock and the, the, the doorknob on the back door and why there was mud tracked right by the threshold on the back door. Can we think of any other possible explanations for this? Sure, Charles. There was more than one thief. Uh, the thief. One thief opened up the back door and then went to the front, unlocked the front door, and allowed other thieves in. And allowed other thieves in, and they all went out the back door, right? Yeah. Or anything else. Maybe I left the front door open. And the thieves came in through the back door and went out through the back door. Or the thieves came in through the front door which I left unlocked. They tried to get in through the back door, but it was locked. They tried, and there's why, that's why there are pry marks, but they never really quite got it open. Came in through the front door, went out through the back door. Oh, but what about the mud? The mud was me from earlier in the day. There are a variety of possible explanations, and what's going on here, remember, is that I'm looking for the inference to the best explanation. I'm going to get a whole bunch of explanations on the board. And I'm going to try to compare them. Let's think of a couple other examples. Let's say, oh... For example, I leave this class, I go back to my office, and when I get to my office, I find that the door is slightly ajar, and when I go in, all of the papers that were on my desk are just like completely strewn about. The window is open, the curtains are blowing in the breeze, and there are feathers and bird shit everywhere. What do you think happened? Is that weird? Does that demand an explanation? Is that the sort of thing where like, I might just walk in and be like, hmm, and then sit down and like, get back to work? Or is it like we all need to stop and figure out what happened? The window was open. This explains maybe why all the papers were strewn about. But yet the bird feathers and the poop, that probably wouldn't just blow in through the window. Perhaps a bird flew in through the window, then got a little freaked out because it couldn't get out, freaked itself out, feathers flew, pooped all over the place, messed up my papers, then where's the bird? 
Yeah, it flew right back out. Ah, I've got an explanation now, right? Are there competing explanations? Yeah, we might, and those of us who are creative and have like fertile imaginations are going to be good at coming up with other competing explanations, right? And this is an, a very important part of engaging in abduction. You have to have some sort of creative storytelling element going on. And this is one of the reasons why this is very different than other sorts of forms of induction. There is this creative storytelling element to it and this comparison of competing explanations. Okay, so back to this. Note that we're talking about the inference to the best available explanation. That means that we need to have many competing explanations. And now we have this question of how is it that we're going to compare these competing explanations? How is it that we're going to decide which of the competing explanations is, in fact, the better one or the worst one? What we're looking for is not just better and worse. We're looking for the best, right? Inference to the best explanation. And the way that we deal with this so far, and when I say so far, it's because this is still a little bit of a puzzle for logicians and philosophers who are trying to figure out, like, what is it that exactly makes a good explanation a good explanation? We have, like, a, these... Eh, let's go ahead and call it six criteria of adequacy. Vaughn in your book calls this five criteria of adequacy, and he says that the first criterion is something that's like, it's so important that we won't even treat it like the other five. We'll just say that like this is a bare minimum. It needs to pass that first criterion. But let's go ahead and call it all six. Like they're, let's treat them all six separately and on even footing. And these criteria of adequacy are consistency, testability, fruitfulness, scope, simplicity, and conservatism. And these are the tools that we're going to use in order to determine whether one competing explanation is better or worse than another one. Yes? Uh, does simplicity have anything to do with like, Occam's Razor? Occam's Razor, yes. Occam's Razor, or the principle of parsimony, is another, another word or another phrase for talking about the criterion of simplicity. Yep. Yep, we will totally talk about that. Oh, how about now, right? Because these are a little bit obscure these six criterion, let's look at them one by one and try to establish what it is that they're telling us and how it is that we're going to use them. So let's start with consistency. Consistency is pretty straightforward. And when we look at it, we're going to get some sense of why it is that somebody like Louis Vaughn, the author of our textbook, is going to say, this one's really important and maybe kind of a necessary condition for any plausible explanation. Consistency just says that an explanation needs to be consistent with the available facts. If my explanation requires that things be other than they actually are, other than like the, the way that I have observed them, that's a serious problem for my explanation. For starters, we might even notice that the explanation needs to be internally consistent. If the explanation contradicts itself, well, that's a big problem, right? Like I can probably chuck the, the explanation right off the bat and say, this is a self-contradictory explanation. But beyond that, it needs to be consistent with all of the observable facts or all of the observable phenomena that I have so far. And remember, when I'm talking about an explanation, I have this kind of collection of things that have been observed. We usually refer to this as the explanandum. Explanandum. And then the thing that gives the explanation, the thing that explains like why the explanandum would be not all that surprising is usually called the explanons. If you're trying to remember that, you can remember that the explanandum is what is explained, and the explanons is what explains what is explained. Does that make sense? A little mnemonic. OK. So the explanation needs to be not only internally consistent, but also externally consistent. It needs to show how all, it is, how all of these observed phenomena to be explained would be likely. And if it conflicts with those observed phenomena, then it's not a very good explanation. Pretty straightforward, right? OK. In addition to all of the observed phenomena so far, it needs to maintain consistency with any new phenomena that might come to light as I'm examining these explanations. Or in the future, if something new pops up, I'm going to have to revisit my explanations and say, like, are all of the competing ones still equally consistent with what's available? That's consistency, and it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty obvious. And my sense is that most people, when they talk about which of two or more competing explanations are better or worse, this is one of the first wells that we go to. And for good reason. It's a very important criterion. That's consistency. Any confusion about this criterion of consistency? OK. Simplicity, which we were just mentioning, also known as Occam's razor, after uh, medieval logician William of Occam. This is actually, I think once we stop and think very carefully about it, this is kind of a weird 
criterion. This criterion of simplicity, also known as Occam's razor, sometimes called the principle of parsimony. It says, all other things being equal, and note that phrase, because that's going to be an important phrase for all of the rest of our criteria as well. All other things being equal, ceteris paribus, the simplest explanation tends to be the most likely one. Why? Why is the simplest explanation something that I would say is probably the most likely one? Is it not possible that there are complicated explanations? What's that, Tar? It's totally, I'd say it's totally possible to have a complicated explanation. It is totally possible to have a complicated explanation. Now, notice we did say all other things being equal. So if there's no other reason to prefer some complicated explanation to a simple one, then the edge goes to the simple one. But still, I might be left wondering, like, why? Because they're pretty? Because they're elegant? Because they fit in my head easily? That's right. There are fewer moving parts, fewer places for the explanation to go wrong, right? Fewer assumptions that I need to make in order to have a simpler explanation. Sometimes we'll talk about this in terms of fewer entities involved in my explanation. Let's go back to, um, oh, let's go back to something like uh, the, the thing with my office with the feathers and the bird poop and all the papers strewn about. What are some other competing, I saw some people's like eyes light up and I was like, are there other explanations? Some people were like, oh yeah, I got one. What are some other competing explanations? Yes? A man who's just been tarred and feathered breaks into your office. A man who's just been tarred and feathered. And by tarred, we mean like covered in bird poop, perhaps? No, actual tar. Actual tar. So where'd the bird poop come from? It's not bird poop. It's not bird poop, it's tar. Okay. That strange form of white tar. Sure, okay. There's a, there's a rare form of white tar that's been used to tar and feather somebody, and he's coming to my office, and what's up with the papers? He's, he's just a troublemaker, and he's like, <laughs> How did he get into my office? Maybe I left it open? The window was unlocked. The window was unlocked? He got in through the window? My office window, as I found out one time when I locked myself out, only opens that much, but okay, all right, let's, for the sake of argument, let's say, yeah, the window was open and he crawled in through the window. This is a possibility. Are there more, is that a simpler, is that a more complicated sort of explanation than the bird got in through the window? What would make it more complicated? Like in one case we have a bird, in the other case I have a tarred and feathered man. But then again, if I have the tarred and feathered man, Somebody must have tarred and feathered him, right? And now, I, now this begs explanation, like, how did that happen? So we can see, like, it starts to get a little more complicated, right? There are more things that need explaining. Okay. Any other competing explanations? Yes? So you have a pissed off student. I have a pissed off student. He really wanted to get back at you. Yes. So he picked the lock. Picked the lock? Yes. He brought in some birds. Like, had a sack of birds. <laughs> he had a sack of birds, released them. Your and the birds went crazy. And then the person, the pissed off student, ransacked the office. And then he opened, and then he opened the window to be like, oh, let's make it look like it wasn't me. Okay. Strange thing for a pissed off student. You think they would want to like, send a message, right? Like, you pissed me off, man. But no, they want to make it look like some sort of natural occurrence. Okay. A little more complicated than the bird just flew in? I think so. Yeah. And therefore, if it's got nothing else going for it, it's not preferable to the bird explanation because the bird one is simpler. Anything else? Yeah. I think an infant crawled in through your window. An infant they, crawled in through my window. Necessarily, but a small child who could fit through the window feasibly. I don't know how he got up to it. That's yeah, because it's like the window is like up here, so the infant would have to get up to the ledge. But then that's possible too. It's possible. It could be a climbing infant. There could, it could have had an accomplice that boosted it up. Put it in through the Perhaps window. Perhaps the parent was a disgruntled student. Perhaps, yeah, well, now we're merging the explanations. Yeah. Maybe it was a disgruntled student, maybe not. And the infant spread your papers everywhere. Yes. Had a jar of bird feathers and a jar of bird poop and spread those as well. The cause mayhem and then fled through the window. Yeah. And, then fl and then egressed through the window. Exactly. Okay. This is possible, no? And if it were the case, it would explain the state of my office. But it is complicated. Most certainly. This also could have, we could have an, 
a box fan. There's a box fan that somehow got the feathers and the bird poop in. If I had a pet bird, and I had a box fan, neither of which I actually do have, so that would be a consistency issue, right? We'd go back to that criterion of consistency and say, like, oh, that's not actually consistent with the facts. But if I had that, then yeah, perhaps that mm, that too. Maybe that one would be simpler than. And I had a box of feathers, and I had jars of bird poop all over the place that just got knocked over by the stiff breeze coming from the fan. That one might actually be simpler because it doesn't involve the bird on top of everything else, right? Like all of those things are established. Like these are established facts about the state of the office. And then my other explanation says on top of that, a bird gets in. And this one says, I can do this without the bird. We can also have explanations that involve aliens. We can also have explanations that involve divine intervention. Like it's, it's, it's a plague. Weirder things have happened. Read Exodus sometime. But if we can say, if we can say, like, I've got an explanation that doesn't require that we bring God into the mix. I have an explanation that doesn't require that we bring aliens into the mix. Then my explanation will probably be simpler. And for that reason, if all other things are equal, that explanation is to be preferred. Yes, Olivia. Yeah, if you hear, hear if, yeah, 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 yeah. And usually this is, uh, folks will use that phrase in lots of circumstances. I hear it a lot in medical diagnosis. Hear hoofbeats, it's probably horses. And somebody says, like, it could be zebras. And you're like, yes, but it's zebras way less often than it is horses, right? This is maybe more straight up inductive. We'll say most of the time when there's hoofbeats, it's horses. Far less often, when it's hoofbeats, it's zebras. So I can do this on the basis of like patterns of frequency, not necessarily in terms of explanation. And I don't know, what do you think? Are horses a simpler answer than zebras? Depends on where you are. Yeah, it could depend on where you are. But if we are talking about medical diagnosis, right? For example, if you're doing like, uh, what's it called? Differential diagnosis. And there's one explanation that says one disease is calling, causing all of these symptoms versus another explanation that says, no, it's actually five different diseases, and it's a coincidence that the patient came down with them all at the same time. Is it clear how the one disease explanation is simpler, and therefore to be preferred, if all other things are equal? And that's my principle of parsimony. That's my criterion of simplicity. Make sense? Okay. The criterion of scope is another ceteris paribus criterion. It says, starts with this assumption, all other things being equal, if all other things are equal, the explanation that can explain more different things is better than the explanation that can explain fewer different things. Sometimes this is talked about in terms of the explanation that has more explanatory power is better than one with less explanatory power. For example, all right, so we've got this business with my office, right? And folks have offered up a whole bunch of competing explanations, and we've said maybe of all of those competing explanations, the one where the bird just flies in through the window, freaks out, and then leaves, that seems to be the simplest one. It requires the fewest assumptions in order for us to get there. But we also have this one that was kind of bouncing around there about the disgruntled student that's looking to prank me. And how they get in through the window, and I say, that, that conflicts with the facts. The facts are that my window only opens this much. And they're like, maybe it was a baby, and we're like, that's assuming an awful lot, because we're going to have to assume like one very agile baby for this. But maybe we say something like, it could be that the student has a copy of your keys and just got in through the door. And I'm thinking to myself, that also requires some assumptions. But what if once this explanation is proposed, I go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now that I think about it, for the last couple of weeks, Almost every day when I come to campus, I park my car, I go, I teach my classes, I do da around in my office for a little while, and then I go back to my car. Almost every day, and I hadn't really thought about it before. It didn't, didn't jump out as something that needed explaining. My car seemed to not be where I left it. I like went to where I thought I parked my car. Does this ever happen to you? You like thought you parked your car someplace, you go there, and like your car's not there, and you're like, huh. Maybe for a second there, you're wondering, like, oh, was my car stolen? 
And then you just kind of walk a little more around the parking lot, and you're like, oh, there it is. It just wasn't where I remember. I, I misremembered where I left it. So this has been happening for several days now, and I just thought it was like weird and my memory was fading. But now I'm starting to think, if somebody's got a copy of my keys and they're disgruntled and looking to mess with my head, maybe they're moving my car on top of that. And as I'm thinking about this and driving home, I get home, and when I get home, all of my furniture in my house has been rearranged. And I ask my wife, did you rearrange the furniture? And she says, nope. Now, it's possible that she's lying. This is also something, yeah, all right. It's possible that the pets rearrange the furniture. That assumes a lot. But now I'm starting to think to myself, this explanation about the disgruntled student that has a copy of my keys, while not simpler than the bird explanation for how my office got messed up, that explanation would explain lots of different things. This has a far greater scope than the bird explanation, right? Because that bird explanation explains the state of my office in a pretty simple way, but it doesn't explain why my car seems to be moving around without me. And it doesn't explain how the furniture in my house got rearranged. Whereas the disgruntled student who has a copy of my keys, or just anybody that has a copy of my keys and is looking to mess with my head, really, doesn't have to be a disgruntled student. This is starting to look like a better explanation because it's starting to edge the other ones out with, with respect to this criterion of scope. Does that make sense? The argument, sorry, the explanations that can explain more diverse phenomena are all other things being equal to be preferred over ones that can explain fewer diverse phenomena. Questions? Okay. The criterion of conservatism. This is an interesting one as well. The criterion of conservatism says, an explanatory theory needs to fit as well, all other things being equal, of course, et cetera, as paribus. Needs to fit as well as possible with all of my existing theories. All of the things that like, I already believe and seem to be working out well so far, if my theory requires me to abandon those theories, it seems like it's not as good of an explanatory theory as one that requires me to or one that wouldn't require me to give up those theories, one that fits with those theories. For example, um, you ever wiggle your toes? Do it right now. Wiggle your toes. I see, like, yeah, front row at least. I see a lot of toe wiggling. Good, good. How do you do that? Like I said, wiggle your toes. Then you thought to yourself, like, I'm going to wiggle my toes. And then you wiggled your toes. How does that work? Maybe you might not think, like, this is something that demands explanation, but I'm asking you now. Explain that. How is it that you have an idea to wiggle your toes, and then you wiggle your toes? Uh, so Olivia says, your brains, have you, have you taken an anatomy and physiology class? No. no. Has anybody here taken anatomy and physiology? What classes do you guys take? You don't take chemistry. You don't take anatomy and physiology. Psych. <clears throat> Olivia says, your, say it again, your brain sends a message, like, like through email, through post. Elect ah, the electrons are involved. Yeah, there's an electrical impulse that goes from my brain through a whole, what, like a series of nerves? Yeah, my nervous system, eh, nervous system, right? There's like a chain of neurons, and there's an electrical impulse that gets passed from one neuron to the next. Something about action potentials and blah, 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 neurotransmitters. And that message gets all the way to my toe, and then it wiggles. And then maybe something comes back, too, right? This kind of like sensation of my toes wiggling around. The boop comes back. And it also matches up with this message that goes from my eyes to my brain that says, like, oh, I saw the toe wiggling. OK. That's what I always thought, too, from the anatomy and physiology class that I took when I was in college. Um, but I saw something last night that made me completely reconsider this explanation. This is what it was. I went out to this place, and there was a guy up on a stage, and he had a lovely assistant, and he had his lovely assistant get into a big box, and then he pulled out a saw and just like, <laughs> like sawed the box in half. And everyone was like, oh, my God, and then took the two halves of the box, one with like the lovely assistant's feet hanging out on one side, the other one with the lovely assistant's arms and head hanging out on the other side, took them to opposite sides of the stage, like walked in between them to show that there was like no connection 
between these two halves. And then he goes to the top half where the head and the arms are, and he says to the lovely assistant, would you please wiggle your toes? And sure as I'm standing here right now, those toes wiggled. Yeah. So if this neuro, like this kind of electrical impulse sent through a neural chain theory was right, this couldn't happen. We have a consistency problem now. Somebody, bless you, somebody contact the neurology department and tell them we need to rewrite all of the textbooks. Because those old theories, they can't work. This is one possible explanation, right? Is that like all of the theories that we had about how it is that one wiggles their toes must be wrong now because they're inconsistent with this phenomenon that I observed last night on a stage. Or, or what? Or the assistant wasn't really cut in half. And it's a trick. An illusion. Yeah, tricks are, yeah, something else. Although the illusion is going to be complicated, right? These, these illusions, this is kind of what makes so-called magic tricks work is that they're usually, the explanation is a little bit complicated. We're going to suffer on our criterion of simplicity, but we're going to do pretty well with our criterion of conservatism. Why should I not completely rewrite the neurology textbooks on the basis of like one strange phenomenon that I've just witnessed? Because those theories have a really good track record so far and I should have some kind of like epistemic inertia with respect to them. I shouldn't go changing my mind willy-nilly at the first sign of trouble with them. There's always this possibility that there's something that I've missed. This is interesting because I think a lot of the ways that we've been talking about these, these arguments or thinking in terms of reasons, thinking well with reasons, seems to suggest like keep your mind open and when confronted with conflicting evidence for the things that you believe, you should be ready to change your beliefs. And perhaps that's true. But at the same time, all other things being equal, all other things being equal, that is to say, if we don't have an edge with respect to consistency or simplicity or any of the other criterion, saying that this jives with the beliefs that I already have and that have been working pretty well for me so far, this is a reason to prefer one explanation over another. Does that make sense? We call this the principle of conservatism because it, it suggests that you should be a little bit conservative in the way that you treat your explanations. The ones that stick with what you already know, don't go, don't go changing that. Don't go dumping good beliefs or otherwise good beliefs at the first sign of trouble. Hold on to them. They've got a good track record. Okay, that's the principle of conservatism. And uh, these last two, let's treat them somewhat together here the principle of testability and the principle of fruitfulness. They go together because they, they kind of bleed into one another. The principle of testability says, all other things being equal, a, an explanation or an explanatory theory that can be tested is better than one that can't be tested. Which is to say, there should be some sort of test that in principle, my theory could fail. For example, with the lovely assistant in the box that's been sawed, if we said, I think it's a trick, what sort of test could I run to tell if it was a trick? I could try to, that's right, I could try to replicate it. And if it turns out very different than what I saw on stage, like if there's way more blood and the toes don't wiggle because I killed the lovely assistant then I might, I might think to myself like, oh yeah, maybe I, maybe I clocked that scenario a little wrong. Oh yeah, maybe I should Yeah. Alternatively, and maybe a slightly more ethically respectable test would be I could try to get up on stage and look in the box and see what's going on and like, oh, lo and behold, there are actually two lovely assistants. One of them's <laughs> curled up with their legs hanging out in the bottom half, one of them's curled up with just their head and arms sticking out on the top half. Yes? That's right. I could do a test where, I, where I'm going to say something like, we're going to wiggle, I'm going to ask you to wiggle your toes, but I'm not going to tell you which foot to do it, and I just show it on like a, a scrap of paper. I write down the message 
to the top half, and I see if they can get it right in the bottom half. And if they don't, I might say to myself, like, yeah, something funny is going on here, right? Or if I don't, yeah, I just don't, I, I whisper it really quietly, and the bottom half doesn't really get a chance to know, yeah, okay, yeah, this could work. That's a good test. Fruitfulness, by the way, is very similar to testability. It has to do with this question of whether or not an explanatory theory generates new questions, new lines of inquiry, and possibly new tests. If my uh, explanatory theory gives me more things to look into. And this starts to get into like kind of basic philosophy of science stuff too. The sort of things that uh, Emery Lakatosh called as uh, progressive research programs. If I have one explanatory theory for a phenomenon that leads to more research and more experiments that can be done, and another one that just kind of dead ends right there, and it's like, that's our explanation, and we don't have any more questions or new tests to run or anything like that, the one that generates more questions, the one that generates new lines of inquiry, is to be preferred. Questions about these? There's a little asterisk down here that says, see conspiracy theories. Sure, let's do that. I think that's the next, uh, after this. So uh, recap, these are all of my criteria. And notice one of the things that's weird about this is that almost all of these criteria were all other things being equal criteria. When I try to do them all together, I might find that like well, all of other things aren't actually equal. I might have a mix, one explanatory theory might have the edge on consistency and testability. The other one might have an edge with respect to scope and simplicity, and then things get really, really complicated. I mentioned uh, C conspiracy theories. Let's look at conspiracy theories for just a second, because conspiracy theories are explanations. They're attempted explanations for phenomena. And I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and say that conspiracy theories, while it's possible that they're true, I'm not saying that conspiracies don't happen they tend not to be very good explanations. And there's a reason why. We can look at the criteria of adequacy that we've like, already established here and show that like, conspiracy theories tend not to do very well according to these criteria. So here we have Tim and Tracy are having a talk. Tim says, I think that that shooting at Sandy Hook, Connecticut, do we all remember this shooting in Sandy Hook, Connecticut? I think that it was a hoax perpetrated by the government to drum up support for gun control legislation. Have you heard this theory before? I've I've heard it many places before. It seems like a very, a very striking sort of a theory. It would be surprising if it were true. That doesn't mean that it's not true. It would just be like fairly surprising if it were true. And Tracy says, you mean to say that you don't think that 27 people were killed by Adam Lanza, that like this whole thing was made up? And Tim says, that's right. That's exactly what I think. And Tracy says, but what about all the witnesses that say that they saw the shooting? What about all the parents of the children who are dead now? What about all of the extensive records and police reports? And Tim says, all of these people are lying. And this just shows you how deep the conspiracy goes. What's going on here? Is this a good explanation that Tim is offering? Yes? Tim should have said, they're all lying. This is why. He needs to show me why they're lying. Because they want gun control legislation. Or they were paid by people who want gun control legislation. George Soros? Why not? They are allegations. Is it testable? Is it simple? It's, yeah, so these are two places where conspiracy theories tend to fall down really hard. Simplicity and testability. It's not very simple because it requires that, like, it requires that this conspiracy run like a well-oiled machine, right? Nobody leaks the truth. Everybody keeps quiet about it. I don't know about you. If you've ever tried to keep a secret amongst a large number of people, that is a very, very difficult thing to do. And to suggest that this is done and that there are lots of moving parts to this conspiracy, this makes the explanation more complicated than one that's simpler. Like, for example, there was one kid who was mentally imbalanced, and he got some guns, and he went and shot up a whole like, kindergarten class and his mom. Which is, like, freaky, but it happens from time to time. And that's a simpler explanation than this conspiracy theory. In addition to this, we have this testability issue, right? 
where like every time, Tim has this thing, this weird thing going on, and this is like one of the cleverest things about conspiracy theories. Clever in a fallacious sort of way, not clever in a sound reasoning sort of way. Any evidence that I bring Tim, where I say something like, but nobody's, nobody's spilling the beans. If this is a conspiracy, how come we haven't heard anybody saying, I was part of the conspiracy? And Tim says, this just shows you how good the conspiracy is. If I say, what about all these people? What about the police records? What about the photos of the dead kids? What about the bodies in coffins? And he says, this just shows how deep the conspiracy goes. Is it possible that I can give any test to Tim's theory? Is it possible that that test could ever be failed? If any piece of evidence that I bring that shows like, ah, I have something that like, is a consistency issue for your theory, if Tim can always say, that just shows you how deep the conspiracy goes, then it seems like in principle, this theory is not testable. He'll just say that they were kids that were murdered someplace else, or we just like went to a morgue, a kitty morgue, and like found a whole bunch of dead kid bodies. And then we paid some actors to act like their parents and be sad on camera. And this is possible, right? It is possible that this happens. It is just really improbable because it's incredibly complicated and it's not testable. Once we start getting into this territory where, and it looks like Tim is responding to evidence. He's like, my theory is really good. It's consistent with all the evidence. We might say something like, it's consistent with all the evidence because it's not testable. Any possible, like whatever test we run, if your theory passes the test, you're like, that just shows my theory is correct. If your theory, quote unquote, fails the test, we say, that just shows you how deep the conspiracy goes. There's no possibility in principle of failing any sort of test. And this is a serious issue for conspiracy theories. Yeah? Let's go with you first, James. And this is maybe where like, folks with different sorts of background assumptions might have a different idea about how to apply the principle of conservatism. I might, for example, say, are you telling me that like, the federal government killed 27 kindergartners just to make a political point. That does not square with my understanding of like, my theory of how our federal government works. And Tim might say, that squares exactly with my theory of how our federal government works. And this might be like, why the theory seems so appealing to, to him, because like, the principle of conservatism is kind of getting him to see it as plausible, right? Yes. Um, yes. You had your hand up. Yes. Same question? Yeah. Is it a conservatism issue? And this depends. Notice that that principle of conservatism relies on like, what your already established beliefs and theories are. And this could be different from person to person. Yes? Well, they would make the point that the 27 children weren't killed, they just never existed. That, they that the 27 children just didn't exist at all. They were made up, and it's, it's a lie. But if I can find bodies in coffins, how's Tim going to explain that? They're bodies in coffins, but they were bodies that we got. They weren't the kindergartners who were shot during the... Yeah, and the records have all been faked. Yeah, like dental records. And he says, like, yeah, it just shows you how deep the conspiracy goes. They fabricated the dental records as well. They made social security cards. They made birth certificates. The government can do all this stuff. Yeah. It's impressive. It, yeah, and we might say, like, yeah, this does not square with my idea of, like, how duplicitous or ruthless the government might be. This also does not square with my idea of how competent the government is, that they could pull this off so flawlessly. So with an argument like that, does it actually ever end? If you can keep going, because this guy's pretty adamant about saying this is fake. I think the best thing that, in my experience with folks who engage in conspiracy theoretical thinking, to respond to them with is to say something along the lines of like, let's leave your theory alone for just a second and let's talk about some, some principles that kind of determine criteria of adequacy for explanations. Let's talk about testability and let's point out that a theory that like whatever evidence we bring to it, it's gonna find a way to accommodate that evidence is in principle not testable. And this is a serious weakness for the theory. And then I might say to this person, 
Your theory seems to match this. That doesn't mean that it's not true. But unless you can give me some other reason to prefer your theory to one that is testable and one that is simpler, you can't fault me for thinking that you're crazy. Crazy, that's, that maybe is a bit strong. You can't fault me for not taking your theory seriously. And maybe even publicly disagreeing with you. Every time I hear you say Sandy Hook was a hoax, like I'll be right there behind you saying, like, I don't think it was, and I think your explanation is crappy because it doesn't satisfy my principle of our principle of simplicity. It doesn't satisfy our principle of testability. Yes, last question. Um, it would strengthen his argument if we found one of the allegedly dead kids alive. Yes, that's true. Uh, it's not, it's not, te uh, so yeah, we might think that this makes his theory testable. Notice, this is something that if it happened, it would support Tim's theory, but if it didn't happen, it wouldn't, it wouldn't undermine his theory, right? So yeah, yeah, testable means I can fail it, right? A good test is something that I could, in principle, fail. Um, take a look at your worksheet, because it has an example of like two competing explanatory theories, and I'll post some solutions to it, and then also keep your eyes peeled for an email. I'm going to be setting up something slightly different. We're going to pedal on this topic for our Friday class. Thanks.